Good morning. My name is Ed Scott, and on behalf of First Unitarian Church of Wilmington, Delaware, I welcome you to our online worship service. This is a welcoming congregation, open to all, to those who come seeking a place for their spirit. You are welcome. Whether you carry hurt or hope in your heart, we welcome you to this family of seekers and dreamers of the spirit. Whoever you are, whatever you are, and wherever you are on your journey, know that you are welcome. This morning, we extend a special welcome to our guest minister, Reverend Danielle DeBona, who has served Unitarian Universalism for 30 years in several capacities. The Reverend DeBona has received a number of honors and was the 2018 recipient of the Award for Distinguished Service to the cause of Unitarian Universalism. Reverend DeBona is on the board of the Church of the Larger Fellowship 
and serves as chaplain to the UUA Board of Trustees. Danielle identifies as biracial. Her father immigrated from Italy and her mother was a Wampanoag, a tribe that has lived on the south shore of Massachusetts for thousands of years. Self-described as retired, Danielle trains show dogs which have been shown at the National Dog Show in Philadelphia and the Westminster in Manhattan. Welcome, Reverend DeBona. And now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Call to worship today is an adapted version of the poem, I'm Not the Indian You Had in Mind, written by Thomas King. I'm not the Indian you had in mind. I'm that other Indian. The one who runs the local bar, the CEO, the movie star, the elder with her bingo tales, the activist alone in jail, that other Indian, the doctor, the homeless bum, the boys who sing around the drum. I'm all of these and they are us. So damn you for the lies you told and damn me for not being bold to stand my ground and say that what's done is not our way. But in the end, the land won't care which one was rabbit, which was bear, who did the deed and who did not who did the shooting and who got shot, who told the truth, who told the lie, who made us laugh, who made us sad, who made the world Monsanto mad, whose appetite consumed the earth. Wasn't me, wasn't me, wasn't me, for what it's worth. Let us join together in worship now. If you have a chalice at home, I invite you to join me by lighting it. As we light this chalice, may we be renewed and centered. May we be the circle of a holy place, that space which for each is our holy ground. And may this chalice bind our hearts as one as we seek to be a light of passion, justice, and life.
Please join me in affirming our mission. First Unitarian Church of Wilmington is a beloved community that nourishes minds and spirits, fights injustice, and transforms the world through loving action. Have you ever been taught something and later learned that what you were taught is wrong? All my life, I was taught that in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue and discovered America. Then, Europeans came to settle the land. The Europeans brought slaves from Africa to work the land. The colonists eventually became tired of being ruled by England and created the United States of America. The people of the United States eventually settled all of the land all the way from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. I wonder if this is what you were taught too. Well, as an adult, I learned that most of that is wrong in so many ways. But today, we are going to focus on the part about Columbus discovering America and people of European descent settling the land. When Columbus arrived in America, there were actually millions of people, maybe even hundreds of millions of people living here. The land was full of people living and working together. Columbus sailed to a place where the Lucayan people lived called Guanahani. Columbus didn't even acknowledge that the place already had a name. And he called it San Salvador. He landed in what we now know as the Bahamas. Columbus did not discover America. His ship landed in Guanahani, an island in the Bahamas. If what we learned about Columbus isn't true, it makes me wonder about the land here, where we have our church, homes, schools, grocery stores, and parks. Well, I learned some pretty interesting things. As long as 10,000 years ago, the Lanai Lenape lived where we are now. When Buddha was born, the Lanai Lenape were here. When Jesus walked into Jerusalem, the Lanai Lenape were here. When Columbus landed in Guanahani, the Lanai Lenape were here. When the Dutch and Swedish settlers arrived in the 1600s, the Lanai Lenape were here. And when William Penn came to this land, the Lanai Lenape were still here. The Lanai Lenape lived in villages. Their homes were called wigwams and were wooden houses. They fished and hunted deer, elk, and bear. Yeah, there were elk and bears on this land a few hundred years ago. They also farmed. They grew corn, beans, squash, melons, and other kinds of foods. Then, in 1638, everything changed for the Lanai Lenape. The Swedes and the Dutch showed up right here in Lenape Hoking, which is what the Lenai Lenape called this land. They showed up right here in what we call Wilmington. The Dutch and Swedes just moved right into Lenape Hoking. They just took some land, built houses, farms, and businesses, and stayed. I wonder how the Lenai Lenape felt about that. Then, something happened over in Europe that the Lanai Lenape knew nothing about and probably couldn't even imagine. The King of England declared he controlled Lenape Hoking and he gave the parts we call Delaware and Pennsylvania to a man named William Penn. William Penn showed up in Lenape Hoking in 1682 
to take control of what he considered his land, which was actually the land of the Lanai Lenape. Historians, the people who study the past and write about it, say William Penn bought the land of Pennsylvania and Delaware. He may have given the Lanai Lenape money, pots and pans, guns, and other items, but the Lanai Lenape did not want to lose their land or leave their homes. The Lanai Lenape were pushed off their land and pushed out of their homes. They were pushed all the way to Ohio by 1740. Then they were moved six more times until many of the Lanai Lenape settled in Oklahoma. Many Lanai Lenape still live in Oklahoma. They are called the Delaware Tribe of Indians. They have their own government, courts, and community. Lanai Lenape also live right here in Delaware. The Nanakote and Lenape Confederation website proclaims, we remained, we survived, we are still here. You see, some Lanai Lenape never left. Others came back years after their ancestors were forced off the land. The Lenape in Dover, Delaware have a council. They have celebrations where they wear traditional clothing. They have a youth group. They have jobs and go to school just like everyone else in Delaware. So you see, when Christopher Columbus landed in Guanahani and the Swedes, Dutch, and William Penn arrived in Lenape Hoking, the land was not available for the taking. There were people here with families and homes. Lenai Lenape, who have a connection with this land that is over 10,000 years old, are still here. It is important for us to know and understand the history of this land where our church, homes, schools, and businesses are today. Many people around the world and right here in the United States have started acknowledging the indigenous or native people who originally lived on the land. One way we can do this is by celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day instead of Columbus Day. We can also practice land acknowledgement. This means that on certain days like Indigenous Peoples Day, Thanksgiving, the 4th of July, gradu graduations, or even just at the beginning of a regular meeting on a regular day, we make time to acknowledge the people who originally and still live on this land. Today, I ask you to join me in acknowledging this land as the land of the Lanai Lenape. Please read along with me. We acknowledge that we gather as the First Unitarian Church of Wilmington on the traditional land of the Lanai Lenape, past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the Lanai Lenape who cared for the land throughout the generations. We commit to learning how to be better stewards of this land for those who will inhabit it in the future. I wonder if you have ever learned something and then need it to unlearn it. I wonder what you know about the indigenous people who remained, survived, and are still here. I wonder how you can be a good steward of the land. I challenge you to find a way to be a good steward of the land, which means to take care of the land as we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day this week. And now, as we prepare ourselves for a moment of centering silence, let us first get comfortable 
and breathe together as we open our hearts. Breathe in, you are the hope. Breathe out, you are the healing. Breathing in, fill your heart with compassion. Breathing out, fill the world with healing. I invite you to say aloud the names of people who are on your hearts and minds or who need care this day. May all those names spoken and unspoken find peace and healing this day. Lewis Ballard, a member of the Cherokee Nation and a classical composer, wrote this piece, One Drop of My Blood. Homeland, beloved homeland, forever take my soul in hand and never let me stray so far that one day I cannot dream of my return to the sacred place where race and kindred all began. I can't, I just cannot do this, see this, hear this anymore. That has been my reaction these last few months as I've attempted to find a way to be in the world while the world is imploding upon itself. Which parent do I deny this year? My father was a proud Italian man born in the village of San Donato on the feast day of San Donato. Of course, that's what they named him after the saint. He would often share with my sister and me the names of all the famous Italians and tell us that all the great art and music came from Italy. He believed in his heart and mind that Christopher Columbus discovered America. My mother was a Wampanoag Indian she was quietly proud that her ancestors were people of compassion and love. 
Her ancestors, with open hearts, welcomed the pilgrims onto our shores and helped them survive over the first few years on this land. While my father openly celebrated his heritage, my mother, not so much. So who do I deny this year? On this holiday, one that is changing ever so slowly. I would happily stay in my bed, put my pillow over my head, and wait it out, well hidden from the world. I was raised in the 50s and 60s, an overtly racist time in my hometown, where the people blocked the purchase of a home by a Red Sox pitcher because he was black. I learned early in life that being Wampanoag was our family secret, and I was ashamed. I learned that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, and at the end of his journey, this brave and brilliant man discovered this land. I did not learn that he massacred most of the native people. I did not learn that the queen called him back in disgrace. I did not even learn that one cannot discover a place where people already live. Welcome to my home. What I did learn was that to claim my proud Wampanoag heritage would put my family in a serious predicament. You see, being an Indian in Massachusetts in the 50s and the 60s meant that you were a drunken, untrustworthy, lazy thief. And my grandfather and uncles could not take the chance that the secret would get out because they needed those jobs and they had to support their families, and no one in my hometown would hire or keep on the payroll a dirty Indian. And so I learned a proud heritage from my father and a deep and frightening heritage from my mother. These scars run deep. There isn't a day goes by that I don't remember my history. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't feel a deep and uncurable anger in my heart. I am diseased, and my friends, my beloveds, my siblings in faith, so are you. I and my Indian family throughout New England walk on land that we know is our heritage. Welcome to my home. We scrape small areas where we can be together and perform our ceremonies of life and death. We carry our ancestors in our hearts and in our arms, and yet we cannot lay them down because there is no place for them. Welcome to my home. This is a dis-ease and we share this disease. We as Unitarian Universalists have done such good anti-oppression work over the decades. I proudly hold that up as a faithful Unitarian Universalist. But mostly white inheritors of Columbus, the Puritans and all others of the dominant culture have not stepped up to the plate when it comes to Indian issues. I often cringe when I hear a UU listing of the people of color, knowing that I will be invisible. Again, in my own faith community, more important than my own little ball of anger is the fact that Unitarian Universalists and our white siblings are blissfully unaware of the land they trod upon. Welcome to my home. Our souls are at stake here. Your souls are at stake here. If you do not remember and remember, along with your Indian siblings, you are participating in the ongoing rape of my beloved land. When the wounds of the land were made to build your building, 
your beautiful building that has become your home, were you able to feel the cut, see the blood, and cry with the earth and my people? Welcome to my home. It isn't until you walk on this land with your heart rather than your feet that you will begin to understand, that you will begin to remember, that you will refuse to be the silent ones who do not see me and my people in the streets, under your building in the ground, in our churches. Your souls, my soul is in peril here. Remembering and remembering is our salvation. And as people of faith, we are called to save souls. I beg you to see me, to truly see me, to see me again. And when you are able to truly see me, you will begin a journey that will bring you into my land in a new way. This land, this very land that your church sits upon, this land that you walk on every day to and from this space. This land really is my land. Welcome to my home. And you will never know me or my people until you embrace that with humility and repentance. And then I will finally, finally be at home in our sanctuaries. And now some good news to soothe your souls. This happened recently. There is going to be the World Games of Lacrosse in Birmingham, Alabama in 2022. Recently, the Irish team decided to pull out of that event to open up a spot for the Iroquois Nationals, a confederacy of Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora nations. This decision represents yet another gesture of gratitude and friendship in response to the Choctaw Nation's $170 donation to victims of the Irish famine in 1845. This donation came shortly after the Choctaw Nation had embarked on the Trail of Tears, and this selfish nature, this gesture, has created an everlasting bond between Irish and Native American people. The Irish team was the last of the eight teams to qualify for the 2022 World Games. And Ireland Lacrosse CEO Michael Kennedy said that it was an easy decision to give up the spot for the Iroquois. The Native Americans finished third in the same competition that Ireland qualified for, but they were originally deemed ineligible. Why, you might ask. Tournament organizers did not recognize the Iroquois nation as a sovereign nation. But a huge amount of social media pressure led the world lacrosse to change its mind. Kennedy said he had been expecting world lacrosse to reach out. I said, look guys, I'm going to make this very easy. We want the Iroquois to take up the position that is rightfully theirs. Lacrosse originated among the Iroquois, Iroquois nation and Kennedy said that the Native Americans are the heart and soul of the sport. See me as Kennedy saw this lacrosse team. See the other Native people right in your community as Kennedy saw this lacrosse team. Welcome to my home.
Please join me in remembering and re-remembering with the words of the Reverend Dr. Denise Hall. As we approach Indigenous Peoples Day, let us remember ourselves to the continual injustices that are perpetrated by dominant cultures' genocide of Indigenous Americans and other historically marginalized people. Now is the time to check, correct, and redirect injustice into truly becoming a covenantal beloved community. Return, return, and return. And so it is. The words of the Reverend Dr. Denise Hall. This morning's Share the Plate is in support of the YWCA of Delaware and their important anti-racism work. Please watch this important message. Hi, my name is Linda Sanders and I'm here today to tell you about the receiver of our special collection today. We will be donating to the YWCA of Delaware's racial and social justice programs. Several years ago, I participated in one of these programs at the Y called Dialogues to Action Conversations about Racism. It was a life-changing event for me. It was my first experience of talking in a small group of mixed races about sensitive topics like my white privilege, implicit bias, racial stereotypes, institutional and structural racism, and I learned how to be authentic and vulnerable in discussing these difficult topics and that has helped me in so many ways in my day-to-day -day life now. Uh, I made some very good friends during those sessions and in fact Alma Scott and I 
are currently co-facilitating one of these dialogue to action groups on Tuesday mornings. And Alma and I are very excited about working together in this important work. Another very good program is a book study group at, um, based on Dr. Kendi's, I consider to be groundbreaking book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Dr. Kendi is a black scholar and he writes very clearly and eloquently about his experiences as a young black boy and growing up black in America. He learned how to identify his own biases and racism and how to strive to be an anti-racist in today's world. I think his, his points are fresh and new and very insightful. In just a few minutes, we're going to hear from Becca Cotto, who is the Director of Racial and Social Justice Programs at the YMCA of Delaware. Becca is an amazing woman who is very committed to the Y's mission, and I'll read it because I don't have it memorized. But her, their mission is to transform communities by changing consciousness, promoting inclusion and solidarity, and cultivating skills in individuals to advocate for justice and inspire a movement. I hope that is a mission that we can achieve in my lifetime. Now, um, let's hear from Becca. And we also will hear from another woman who's participated in these programs. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Cott. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm the Director of Racial and Social Justice for YWCA Delaware. This is my third year standing before you to thank you so much for the generous contributions that you'll give today um, for your special collection Sunday for YWCA. Three years ago, I was so nervous to stand before you. I, it was the first time I was speaking in public on behalf of YW, and now I count so many of you as friends and co-conspirators in this anti-racist work. It's amazing. Um, First Unitarian has been such a huge support of, supporter of ours in so many ways, from our very first dialogue sessions to hosting one of those groups here and providing facilitators, um, hosting our very first action forums. I uh, led a book study on how to be an anti-racist and I just get a lot out of helping people learn about anti-racism work and white privilege and what we can do about it and I find myself learning about it and making connections and building relationships with people I wouldn't ordinarily come in contact with. Um, so it's exciting. I highly recommend either the book study or the conversations around racism. They're empowering and working to end racism and create anti-racist policy. So join me. Hi, I'm Karen Gladney, and I'm one of the facilitators in YWCA Delaware's racial and social justice programs. Before my involvement in the racial and social justice programs at YWCA, I didn't know what anti-racism work was being done in my community. I was curious about YW's mission, particularly the purpose of eliminating racism and empowering women. I come from a line of strong and determined Black women who have had to hold their own. The values instilled in me have been the foundation of the legacy that I want to leave for my children and grandchildren, and especially my daughter and granddaughters. My participation in the book studies and Dialogues to Action have been a great opportunity to talk about my experiences with racism learn about racism in the lives of others, and to collaborate on some recommendations for social change in the community. As both a participant and a facilitator, I've formed alliances with others of various ages, races, ethnic, and religious backgrounds. It was great having the perspectives of others on how to best address uh, systemic racism in our communities. On a more personal level, I've made a lot of new friends um, with like-minded values and interests. And because of my involvement in YW's programs, I've had a direct impact on the issues facing my community regarding racism. I've gained a broad and diverse network of colleagues and friends, and my involvement has also made me feel very proud as a Delawarean to be a part of such a vital social change. YW's racial and social justice programs are really making things happen, and I'm happy to be a part of that. Thank you for listening.
Thank you for your gifts to your church. Here are three ways to make a donation or an offering. You can mail your checks to First Unitarian Church, 730 Halstead Road, Wilmington, Delaware. And please indicate Sunday offering in the memo line. Or you can go to our online donation page at firstuuwilm.org and donate now. The third way is to use the Gift Plus app on your smartphone. Select First Unitarian Church of Wilmington and tap Give Now. Choose the desired fund and follow the prompts. Please join me in the dedication of our offertory to the work of this congregation, which is weaving a tapestry of love and action. We dedicate our lives and these are offerings. May you leave this space and tread upon the earth gently. 
may your heart be renewed, may your spirit be rested, and may you go and change the world, knowing that the world needs you. Amen. We extinguish the flame, but not the truth or the warmth of community. May they guide your way until we are together again.
Thank you.